Good morning. Good morning. Whoever you are or wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. This is a very exciting Sunday for us, and we are happy that you have chosen to worship with us. Welcome to those of you on Zoom. We ask you to mute yourselves so as to not disturb the service when you're drinking your coffee and cooking your chicken soup. <laughs> and uh, we also ask you to silence your cell phones, please, now. Usually there's one or two who can get, so if you could do that right now, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, today we are celebrating the arrival of our new organ. Yes. <laughs> members of the Bissell family with us. The organ is a gift from their family. Their parents set up a trust many years ago. They were faithful members of this congregation and uh, believed in it, believed in music. They also gave gifts to other community organizations equal to ours. But we were thrilled it arrived on Tuesday and I've seen very little of Daryl since. <laughs> so uh, we're going to be telling you more about it. There will be a dedication concert sometime in July. We're working out those details with the family because we want to make sure as many of them as possible can attend. But we're glad you came today and are the first to see this being played in our congregation. We're continuing a long tradition of organ music, not only in First Congregational Church, but in the United Church of Christ as well. In your bulletins, you have this called a connection card. Uh, we invite you to fill this out, especially if you're visiting. And on the back, let me know anything you'd like me to know, if you want me to call you, if you want a prayer. And there's a place to mark for pastor only so I don't put it out in the weekly email. You know Murphy's, we got a hotline to gossip. So if you aren't careful, it might get out there. So, and also, if you want to participate in any of our programs or want more information, and then we'll put these in the offering plate. So if you're visiting, don't feel you have to give monetarily. Our service is our gift to you, and your presence is your gift to us. Our theme today is unity, and we really need unity. So let us prepare our hearts for worship as we hear the prayer. Thank you. 
being here today. Even though the world seems to be falling apart, isn't it wonderful that we're able to come together and praise God? Stand if you would like and join me in the responsive call to worship as I begin. We come today from diverse homelands, backgrounds, and experiences. We are not the same, but one in Christ. We are different ages and abilities, and yet we gather as one people. We are not the same, but one in Christ. With diverse hopes and dreams, we gather to worship. We have different personality types and interests with multiple ministries and callings. We are not the same, but one in Christ. We carry with us many voices holding happiness alongside hurt. Inside every one of us, we experience a crowd of ideas, feelings, and questions. We are not the same, but one in Christ. In Christ, we come together and find a deeper unity. People of God, come and worship that out of many, all may be one. Come worship our God. Let us continue with our opening prayer as I begin. Living and loving God, we come to you as one people with many backgrounds, traditions, gifts, and callings. We gather to celebrate our oneness, to remember Jesus' devotion, to complete love for all humankind, and to give of what we can to sisters and brothers around the world. Giving and loving God, lead us through this time of worship. Give action to our words and our faith as we stretch ourselves beyond these church walls to places across the planet. For we know that when we love and give to others, we are loving and giving to you, O oh God. Amen. Our opening hymn is Community of Christ, found on page 314 in your hymnal.
may be seated. Let us come to a time of awareness. You know, we call ourselves Christians. We say we live in unity. And then we see the travesty. And we're not feeling so much like we have unity. But God hears us. And so let us pray together our prayer of awareness. God of all people, we confess that we sometimes forget we are one in many. In our world of me, mine, and ours, we neglect the needs of others outside of our own families. We forget about the losses of other people stuck in cycles of poverty and despair. Revive us, O oh God. Lead us out of our self-consumed and overworked lives into community. Guide our feet to action, our hands to embracing, our hearts to loving, and our lives to sharing the many things with which you have blessed us. In the name of Jesus, the one who inspires us to love one another, we pray. Amen. Let us be in silence. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear the assurance of God's grace. We can rejoice. Jesus said, I am come that you might have love and have it more abundantly. In this we can rejoice. I invite you to stand and sing Halle Hallelujah. <laughs> Doesn't this look beautiful? Not only Sorry, does it look beautiful, it sounds beautiful. Can everyone see? Yeah. Spread out a little bit. Hey, JT, I'm gonna, you're tall. Let's use a little bit back. Yeah. Lots of pretty things on the organ, all kinds of buttons, all kinds of little gadgets. There's an accelerator pedal. It doesn't go faster, but it makes it go louder. And guess what? I play with my feet, too. Look at the notes down there. So many different things. You know, in the in Psalms, there are a lot of uh, instruction for us to praise God with instruments. And so I want to read a little bit of Psalm 150. Praise be to God. Praise God in God's sanctuary. That's a big word, isn't it? Yes. Then it says, praise God with trumpet. That's a trumpet sound. It says, praise God with a lute. A lute is like a guitar. All kinds of sounds in here, other than organ sounds, which makes it really cool. 
Actually, there are 300 different sounds in this instrument. Well, then it says, praise God with the heart. And it's an orchestra, heart. Praise God with strings. Praise God. Praise God with pipe. A pipe is like a flute. Pretty cool, huh? All these different sounds on the organ to help us praise God. Okay? So look here, we got two keyboards, not just one. So when I, I do a little echo sometimes, or I can bring out a melody, you know this tune? Anybody know that? Don't know it? You do too, you know it. What is it? No, it's Jesus Love Me. Well, since we sang that, we're going to sing it in a little bit. So, and when I'm going to set up a sound for you so we can sing Jesus Loves Me. And I can play with my feet. See that? Uh huh. Or we can play, or we can make really loud sounds. Think that's funny, huh? Yeah, that's just playing with my feet. Look, Mom, no hands, right? So we can have soft sounds, we can combine sounds, and get louder and louder. The more buttons I press, it gets louder. And they light up, you see that? sing louder, okay? So the organ can help lead us in our songs. So we're going to sing Jesus Loves Me, all right? And on this keyboard, I'm gonna put chords. Pretty cool. So make sure you come to church. Come early, and I often will play a prelude on the organ, and some of the songs will be singing on the organ. We're still going to use the piano. There's like Hale Hale, it sounds really cool with, on the piano, but some songs sound really cool on the organ. So we are really blessed that we have this new instrument to help us praise God. All right, Thank Master you. Bond. Yes, yeah, so now you can go to Sunday school with your teachers. This song, song today is really in two parts. In the first part, the glory of God is revealed, but that sovereignty is not based on brute force. Indeed, the foundation of God's throne consists of righteousness and justice. God's power is not arbitrary, but expresses God's character of mercy and truth. And God exercises this rule by intervening in the history of people. 
The second part of the psalm shows how nature and human beings respond to the revealing of God's glory. Nature's response is simple and clear. The heavens proclaim God's righteousness, but among human beings, the response is mixed. The psalm frankly admits that not all people worship God. And so, when God's glory is revealed, those who worship idols are ashamed. Even the idols bow down to the one true God. Let us hear now this powerful song. God rules. There's something to shout over. On the double, the main, mainlands and islands celebrate. Bright clouds and storm clouds circle round her. Right and justice anchor her rule. Fires blaze out before Yahweh, flaming high up the craggy mountains. Her lightnings light up the world. Earth, wide-eyed, trembles in fear. The mountains take one look at God and melt, melt like wax before the earth. The heavens announced that the Holy One set everything right, and of everyone will see it happen. Glorious. All who serve handcrafted gods will be sorry. And they were so proud of their ragamuffin gods. On your knees, all of you, worship God. And Zion, you listen and take heart. Daughters of Zion, sing your hearts out. God has done it all, has set everything right. You, God, are high God of the cosmos, far, far higher than any of the gods. God loves all who hate evil, and those who love the Creator will be safe. God snatches them from the grip of the wicked. Light seeds are planted in the souls of God's people. Joy seeds are planted in good heart soil. So God's people, shout praise to God. Give thanks to our holy God. Let us be grateful for the reading of God's holy words. Amen. In keeping with our theme of unity today, our anthem is a prayer from the Roman Catholic tradition. It's a prayer from the Gospel of Luke when the angel appears to Mary to tell her she's with child. The song is Ave Maria and has been around for centuries. Most people know it because it was made popular by Franz Schubert in 1825 as part of his Opus 52 and there was a seven song setting and this piece comes from the Lady of the Lake, Ellen's third song. And that's how most people know it, even though it's been around for centuries. It's often sung in masses, funerals, weddings, and the sacred hours in Catholic, Anglican, and Lutheran churches, but most Christians recognize it. The words to the full Ave Maria prayer, not the one in Schubert's work, which is very different, are this. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The last verse about Mary being our intercessor was not added until about the 1400s. So today I invite us to hear this as a prayer of mercy for all the children and adults that have been killed to gun violence in our country. Since last Sunday, there have been nine mass shootings, nine since last Sunday. 24 died and 54 injured. Mary, Mother Mary, lost her son to a tragedy, and she knows our pain. This is a universal language to all of us. This particular rendition is sung by Marguerite Close and accompanied by Janet Telford and Dr. Darrell. And I pray that it will move us to compassion and action. Hear now this beautiful song.
Mary weeps with us. So our lesson is from John 17. And if you were here last week, you know I tried to read it to you early. I got confused. So I'm back on track today. For it's chapter 17, and Jesus is praying for the disciples. And he's praying to God. I ask not only on behalf of these but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in them, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you've sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. What a powerful prep, prep, prayer and passage that Jesus is praying for us to be one and for us to know God and be loved so that we can tell others that we are loved, that they are loved. So I want to review a moment that John in this gospel is speaking to disciples and followers of Jesus after Jesus has already died and been resurrected. So he's, telling, he's retelling what he believes Jesus said. And the reason he's doing this is because there's disunity among the followers of Jesus. They are arguing. They're having a terrible situation about who can be allowed into the synagogue. And... Um, there's traditions that are supposed to be kept, and so if you don't keep them, you don't get to worship God. So they're struggling over these things, and so John is saying, wait a minute, Jesus prayed that we might be one. So that's who he's speaking to. It's a beautiful prayer. I can imagine Jesus uttering this prayer today. I almost called my sermon, Christians Give Christ a Bad Name, but I thought, well, I won't go there today. So I called it Life in a Canoe. Why this title? It's kind of weird, but you know, I live on a lake. And so not long ago, I was watching two, a brother and a sister, teenage brother and sister, get into a canoe. And it was obvious they had never been in a canoe before. And uh, the young woman was sure that she knew how to paddle, and she was convinced that she was going to show her brother how to do it. And he's arguing, and they're yelling, and she says, do it like this, and she's showing him on the side. So he goes on the side with her, and they go around in a circle. And then she says, no, go to the other side. He says, but you told me that side. So she, he goes on the other side. Well, he's kind of a big brute, and so he's overpowering her, so they still go in a circle only the other way. And she says, okay, this isn't working. And he says, well, why don't we paddle together? Use and I'll paddle or I'll match. And I'm thinking, okay, somebody's wise here. And pretty soon they're going across the lake. Every once in a while they forget. You know, life in a canoe is a lot like real life. You can canoe by yourself. I have a kayak and I can go pretty fast. But when the middle of Lake Alpine, when a storm comes up, being in the kayak by myself is not too much fun getting back going against the wind. But in a canoe, if you've got two people, you can go further. When one is tired, the other can take over, actually. But if both of you are paddling the same strength and the same way, you can go really far and really smoothly. Unity, life in a canoe. Ironically, the concept of unity in church could be like a canoe, and it's become quite divisive over the past hundred years or so. People mostly understand that the Bible calls for Christians to live in unity but in conflicting ways. So there are kind of several ways to think about it. One extreme is unity at all costs. Some people say that if we were truly Christians, we would organize ourselves institutionally, or at least corporately, as a single body of believers, so you wouldn't have all these different denominations. There wouldn't be doctrinal disagreements between Catholics and Protestants and evangelicals and theological liberals which what, are, what does that do? It really damages our ability to influence the world for God's good or to let people know they're loved. So some say we should set all those differences aside and unite in a greater cause to make the world better. Well, it's true. I mean, if Jesus were in the midst of the abortion issue right now, surely he would weep 
at either side calling themselves Christian, using his name to justify rhetoric and hating each other all the while. The problem I see with this expansive idea of unity is that it would be a shallow unity because we do disagree on some very fundamental questions, like what does it mean to be a Christian? Who is God? Is there only one God? Is there only one way to know God? Who is Jesus? Was and is he divine? What must people do to be saved, if anything at all? Or do we need to even be saved from sin? So you see, we can have different disagreements about this, and it's hard to imagine how a one unity could be fostered. Organizational unity for its own sake is pretty meaningless. So we could go the other extreme and we could say, okay, no unity at all. At this end, there are many Christians who think unity is a bad word. They're separatists and they think of, of any kind of ecumenism is confusing and contrary to gospel purposes. You and I have both heard this. Well, why don't Christians all get on the same page? Why do we have 10 different churches in one town? How can one denomination be blessed by God and not others? In this arena are churches that believe they're the only true church. And so this is a camp where people place the focus on doctrines they believe are absolute and anything else is wrong. This has led to an image of God that can be heroically narrow and judgmental, not where I want to be. So I propose there's a third way, avoiding extremes true Christian unity. That's where I hope we focus today and what I believe Jesus prays for. Jesus prayed that all would be one and love one another in the same way that he loves us. When we avoid, criticize, or argue with each other, insisting on our own way, we hurt Jesus as well as ourselves. But when we listen to God speaking and open our hearts to one another, then I believe we can achieve unity. Now, let me say that unity doesn't mean we're going to agree on everything. If there's one thing I have learned at First Congregational Church, then we will never agree on everything. Instead, it's a position or a posture of life giving relationships, in giving relationships that say, I'm here for God and I'm here for you. I can give up myself and I can give up my position for others. I don't often preach sermons of advice because I think they're dangerous as Advice is an episodic, specific event, and what works for one person will not work for the other person. But today, I want to suggest some ways which we can behave towards one another that will let others know we follow Jesus. They'll know we're Christians by our love. This is the kind of unity the world needs today. The tragic events of the week shows us that our divisiveness over gun control has led to the devastation of lives. The political posturing of leaders have forced people with mental illnesses to be hidden and untreated. Instead of working together, those in power make decisions based on how it feeds their own desires, finances, and egos. Now, we cannot only blame those at the top. We need to look at our own lives and see if we are living in an inclusive and just way. Do we speak up when we see racism? Do we act and vote to stop laws that endanger our transgender brothers and sisters, or do we sit silently and make judgments? Jesus is speaking of a unity that is full of love and action. This is not a theology that's solely for Christians either. Most religions have a creed of love and action. The tragedy this week kind of left me off center, unsure of what to do next, how to feel, and not clear on what will end these vicious killings. What I do know is that how we respond will leave a mark. A lot of my clergy colleagues went on Facebook and posted these marvelous words of what we should do or how we should feel, or, you know, and I, I appreciated them. I wish I could have said them, but I had no words. I could not bring myself to write a single thing because I was so distraught and because I saw no end in sight to this nonsense. But I've often said that people will know we're Christians more by our reactions than our actions. Now, one of the great beauties of this particular parish is there's very little that seems to harm our Christian unity. We're good listeners to each other. 
We're willing to ask questions and willing to let some time lapse as we think and pray about difficult issues. And I'm extremely grateful to parish such a, to pastor such a flock as this. Back uh, when there was an election that was quite testy, I offered classes on how to communicate with one another when you're voting on opposite sides of politics. And people thought I was crazy. <clears throat> Pastor Bonnie, are you sure you really want to address this in church? I said, no, we're not addressing it on Sunday morning because Sunday morning is our safe zone. It's our place where we can come with all our burdens and joys and never feel pushed up against the wall. But in that class, that was where we were going to say what we thought and say what we felt and be heard and be loved. And it was marvelous, I have to say. Of course, only about 10 people were brave enough to come. <laughs> but there are issues where feelings get stronger and run amok. Take mask wearing, for example. If you live in Calaveras County, you're likely to get punched if you wear it to the post office. Take gun control, abortion, housing for the homeless, candidates for office, and I could go on and on. In our community, we've seen people blame others, steal yard signs and become angry and even threaten the lives of other people. Let me give you an example. When we say we love others and accept other points of view, but then we go on Facebook and we tell people to go to H, you know, or F you, then we are not the Christians we proclaim to be, I say. We have lost our way a little bit. Facebook gets nasty when we dare to oppose opposite remarks about face mask, race, homelessness, abortion, and transgender issues. Yes, I've dared to name the things that separate us often, and even as I speak them, I'm aware that some will not like this microscope that I'm opening on our behaviors. And I have a little knot in my stomach when I do it, thinking, is this safe? Ah, sure, you can hear it. But here at First Congregation, we hold on to one another in these tough times. That's what we've done. It's not true in many places, and there's disunity that crumbles churches and causes people to give Christ a bad name. I mean, you look in the newspaper all the time, and you're seeing people proclaim things in the name of Christ which are heinous. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not asking you to do or agree for everything my way. I would like it, but it's never going to happen. And I'm not asking you to keep quiet about your insights, your longings, and your dreams for community and world. What I'm asking is for us to live in unity with each other. And so if we practice this here in church, which is what I had us do a number of years ago at that class, then how much easier is it in our everyday lives? Because I don't know about you, but I've even got family members who cannot stand what I believe. And that makes it tough to say I love you. So how do we do it? Here's where the advice comes in. My first piece of advice. Make no distinction about people in a discriminatory sort of way. Remember that in God's eyes, there are no distinctions. We're told there's neither male nor female, young or old, rich nor poor, all of God's children. There are people who will hold up the Bible and tell transgender people that they're against God's way. I think they forgot the passage where it says there's no male or female. I think they forgot it. Let's not look at people's backgrounds, economic, sexual orientations, education, ethnicity, or anything, and discourage us from reaching out to build loving relationships. Can you imagine what our world would be like if every child was taught and every family was taught to love and not do evil for evil? A number of years ago, Jerry Carson Hall sent me an article about a family, uh, community in Africa. And when somebody had done something wrong, they would gather that person into the center of the community and then they would tell them their good qualities. Whoa, whoa, is that ever life changing? Some denominations and some Christian groups, I know it for a fact, I've been a part of it. Amish and Mennonites actually shun and shame the person, have them get up in front of the congregation and confess. We have a lot of work to do to change this vengeful paradigm. I once knew a young man who came to me asking if he could be part of our church even though he was divorced. I said, of course you can. Why not? I'm divorced and be married. Hallelujah. <laughs> he stated that when he became divorced, the parish leaders told him he was no longer welcome in his church. Wow. 
So he joined us, and later I said, would you like to be a liturgist? And he said, what, you're kidding me, right? I can actually read the scripture? I'm divorced, you know, Pastor Body. <laughs> I'm like, it's totally okay. You can read the scripture. I will never forget that day when that young man read. I cried, and he cried, because his gifts were phenomenal. But he had been blocked from using them because somebody had an opinion about divorce. The third way to live in unity is to immerse ourselves in God's word. That's why you showed up. Well, maybe some of you showed up to hear God's word. Maybe some of you showed up for the organ or just to sing or because you wanted to see your friends. It doesn't matter to me. You're here. <laughs> so understanding the Bible is not easy. And at United Church of Christ, we don't believe that the Bible is the only way we hear God. So we come to hear God in our music, in our prayers, in our meetings, through one another, because the Holy Spirit's working in you just as the Holy Spirit's working in me and has given us wisdom. And so I get my wisdom from you, and you get it from me, and we pass it on. And the fourth thing for, you, for unity is forgiveness. When I do weddings, I tell couples in their counseling session, I think, I said, well, sex is probably what got you interested, and love is what made you want to be married, but forgiveness is what is going to keep your marriage going. <laughs> because there are going to be a lot of things happening that you're going to need to forgive. And they don't like to hear that when they're all starry-eyed and googly-eyed at the altar. <laughs> but forgiveness is what's going to keep us together. The same thing with unity. You know, if you have a grudge against somebody, I say it's like an angry porcupine. You're holding a grudge, and whoever touches you is going to get hurt. But the grudge also hurts you because it's like carrying a big weight on your back. And you can't move because you got this weight. Once you give up the grudge and listen and forgive, then you're free from it. We can do this, friends. We can do this. When we love each other, the world will know we're Christians by our love. So where's the good news? I've been a little hard on you. Well, you're the good news. We are growing here at First Congregational spiritually. We're growing in numbers. We're starting to come together. Our teams are reaching out, we're working in the community, we're feeding the hungry and helping the homeless, and we're struggling with those answers about gun violence, about abortion, about transgender individuals. And in religious circles right now, the big debate is who can take communion? Really? Who can take communion? Well, I've been in a church that wouldn't let me take communion because I was not baptized in their denomination. But the good news in our congregation is our feast is open to everyone, and next Sunday we'll have Holy Communion. And we say it's God's gift to us. You don't have to do anything. You just show up and partake. And so I'm not trying to pat ourselves on the back, but I am going to share my gratitude for holy people right here and now. And people will know we are Christians by our love. Amen. So I invite you to stand if you like, and we're going to sing Thank Our God for Sisters Brothers, which is on our insert.
may be seated. Let us come to a time of prayer. All loving creator of us all, we have heard you speaking, and we know that we need to live in unity with one another. So open us up to possibilities of hearing each other. Give us wisdom and solutions to stop the gun violence that is happening every day. Emblazon us with your boldness so that we will speak out, so that we will vote, so that we will encourage our leaders to do the right thing that can change lives for good. We do thank you, Holy One, for this blessed congregation, for the ways we do hear each other, and even when we disagree, we still come to church and we still work it out. Let that be an example as we live our lives in community and on Facebook and Twitter. Let us remember that people are watching. God, our hearts hurt today for those who have died. I can't even fathom it. It just doesn't even, I just can't imagine it. For those people who lost such young children. And the reality is that people are dying every day in Ukraine and many other wars, and also through gun violence and poverty. We weep with you, God. Restore us and let us do better. Let us continue to find ways to take care of all your children. We pray this morning for those who are sick and those who are on the healing mend. We pray for Tabitha and Steve for Hillary, Katie, and George, and those suffering from COVID. God, we really want this COVID thing to be done. We're so tired of it, but there are many who are still sick. Keep us vigilant and being careful and being safe. We thank you for our teachers and our children and all the beautiful children that came today. We pray that we might be able to instill in them that their love, they will feel no need to reach out and be angry at other people. We pray that we might be able to keep them safe. We thank you for our organ today. What a great gift we've been given. What a blessing. As we hear it, our hearts swell as the organ swells. And we thank you for the family, the Bissell family, that was so generous in giving it to us. May we continue to be faithful stewards of it and all our gifts. God, we pray for ourselves. You know, we come to church and we want everything to be okay. But we know that back home, someone's angry. Someone's hurting. A child disappoints. Someone has addictions. Someone is struggling with their mental health. And so we bring these to you because you love and you care so tenderly for us. So we ask for your mercy on those who are suffering today. We pray too for those who are grieving in our community. We know that there are many who are sitting alone at the table for the first time. May you be present to them. And we thank you for Jesus who has shown us the way and we pray the prayer he taught us and I invite you to pray it any way you know it. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Let us not fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. One of the joys of living in unity is sharing our gifts. We now have the opportunity to offer mercy and love to others through our monetary contributions. You may place your connection cards in the offering plate. Will the ushers please come forward?
join me in a unison prayer of dedication. Generous God, bless these gifts that we return to you, and bless the hearts that give. Unite our hearts with those hearts that will be strengthened, helped, and healed through these gifts. May this money be used faithfully and purposefully, furthering your reign of compassion and justice around the world. Amen. Our sending hymn is, They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Love, found in the insert. benediction song. We ask you to be seated for the postlude. Uh, we're not just doing this today. We do it every Sunday because we are being recorded and folks like to hear the postlude. So uh, we appreciate that. Next Sunday's Pentecost. Woo! Time for celebration. We have to read. Uh, so we invite you to come at 10 minutes early and we're going to start a procession in the parking lot and we'll come in waving our red streamers and we will have our red banners up and the Holy Spirit is going to do some good work. Amen. Today, uh, we have some turkey and rolls left over from the fundraiser yesterday. Thanks to Joe Jackson and his team, we had a great fundraiser. The turkey is fantastic. So um, if you want to take some turkey and rolls and make a donation, okay. If you don't have money for donation, take some anyway. Um, next Sunday, we're taking in new members. So, oh, this is, I'm so excited. Anybody who knows me knows that I just can hardly contain myself when we have new members. So this week, I'm finalizing a meeting with some of them to work through the classes and to study our vows. 
We're also having four people baptized next Sunday. Woohoo! Pentecost. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And they're going to have a reception right after worship. So our all camping church camping trip is coming up. There's a sign up sheet. Please sign up, and you'll be getting more directions this week. I'll be sending out a flyer of what to do. But I hope you all come. We're not going to have church here on the 17th. You're all invited to Big Trees group camping, and we'll have a little map. Don't worry, we'll get it to you at 10 o'clock, and we'll have worship up there together and lunch afterwards. We do need volunteers to bring goodies for hospitality hour. There's a seat, sheet to sign up for that as well. And we could use some more ushers. Carl does a great job, but we can need people. And then last but not least, um, Taze service is Wednesday. If you've never come, now's the time to go. Because we need to pray. We need to pray. It's a wonderful service of chants and candles and prayers and a little reading. And Reverend Penny Asarvis is going to be our leader this week. So please come. Daryl also wants to invite anyone who wants to look at the organ after the service this Sunday and future Sundays. He's, he will show you anything you want to. He would love to. But he can explain what all the buttons and the stuff's for. Uh, so after worship, if you come up and hang around, ask him any questions that you have about it. So we thank the Bissells for coming, and we will be seeing you again. We know we have our celebration sometime in July. So hear now the benediction. Friends, we can live in unity. It might mean dying to self, but we can do this. And why? Because God loves us. Amen. Amen. Let us stand and sing our benediction song. Amen.